Good evening. I'm Joanna Marsh, the James Dickey Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for the third and final lecture in the Clarice Smith Distinguished, Distinguished Lecture Series for the 2010 calendar year. Uh, as always, we'd like to extend our very special thanks to Clarice Smith, um, whose generous support makes these programs possible. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, um, a few housekeeping issues. I'd like to ask all of you to turn off your cell phones and other mobile devices, please. Um, also, there will be a question and answer period following the lecture, and we kindly request that um, all questions be addressed uh, at either of the two microphones, which are positioned um, in the aisles, sort of midway up uh, the auditorium. Tonight's program is being webcast live, so we want to ensure that all of the questions and answers um, are heard by our web audience. Now to the main event. Uh, we are thrilled to have Sarah Z with us this evening. The artist joins us from New York City, where she lives and works. Uh, Z received a bachelor's, uh, excuse me, a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Yale University in 1991, and an MFA uh, in 1996 from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. In 2003, she was awarded the prestigious MacArthur Genius Award, um, and her work can be found in public and private collections worldwide. Most recently, she's had solo exhibitions at Tanya Benactor Gallery in New York, Victoria Miro Gallery in London, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. Since the late 1990s, Z has been creating site-specific sculptural installations that penetrate walls, buildings, and even burrow down into the ground. These intricate yet immense works profoundly affect the way we see and experience space, whether it's a gallery, a domestic interior, or the corner of a street. Over the years, Z's labor-intensive practice has become a signature part of her sculptural aesthetic. Each installation is constructed from a myriad of everyday objects, from cotton buds and tea bags to water bottles, ladders, and light bulbs. These commonplace items are presented as leftovers or traces of human behavior that have been set free from their utilitarian purpose and are imbued with a new vitality and presence in each of her installations. Z's careful consideration of the tension between the throwaway and the precious the humble and the monumental, the incidental and the essential, generates an experience of space that both disorients and reorients the viewer at every turn. Now please welcome, please join me in welcoming Sarah Z. Thank you so much, John. That was really thoughtful, wonderful introduction. I also want to thank Betsy Brun for having me here and um, Nona Martin for hosting me and arranging this. Um, and of course, Clarice Smith. I, you know, lectures like this were so important to me when I was a student. Um, and I think it's wonderful that this, this series exists. So thank you, Clarice Smith. Um, I'm going to start here with some early work. Let's see. Um, this is one of, one of the first pieces that I did in graduate school, and, uh, and jo Joanna made a really nice point about this kind of trying to figure out, trying to locate where an, when an object is utilitarian and when it's, it's aesthetic. And I'd started, as an undergraduate at Yale, I'd started by studying painting and architecture, and I came to sculpture really from those two directions. And the first question that I really posed when I came to, to sculpture was, how do you create value in an object? How do, how do I create it? How do you create it? How does society create it? And I, I wanted to sort of set this problem for myself where, um, where I took a kind of material that was only thought of in a practical sense, um, uh, was very you know, essential utilitarian material, but it wasn't thought of aesthetically. So this entire piece is made out of toilet paper. 
And the way that <laughs> And the way that I did it was I sat in one corner of my studio and I, um, I took one sheet and I, and I crafted it in a certain way until I sort of got bored and I put it down. And I wanted to sort of cover the space um, in a way that questioned monumentality as well. Something that felt like it was present everywhere, but also you could just blow it away. Um, I was sort of thinking about the idea, I'm gonna go back to this one, but um, of a weather in a space, how you know the temperature of this room, if it were hot, would totally change our experience of the space. But it's something that we don't realize or think about lighting or temperature or weather in a space. So um, this room actually, this piece was originally done in my studio and I was asked to put in a show. It was a show of, of young graduate students in New York um, and in my studio, it was sort of, as I said, I just put it down as I went and backed out of the space. Um, and they wanted to, me to put it in the middle of the gallery floor, like a rug. And it was very important to me that there was this strange intersection of what was a, you know, a real life situation and art, so that these two things were melded in a way that when you came to it, you sort of really questioned where the art began and where it ended. So there was actually a back storage room. It was actually the, the building of Leo Castelli's um, gallery space and this back empty storage room was was like this also a kind of interesting space because there were these lined with windows and this beautiful light but you know of course they had put up um, a white a, a wall to create a white box um, so but one of the things that I also like to play with is to play with natural light and found light and to have a piece that actually does reflect real weather so that this piece looked different at different at different times of, of the day um, after that piece, I started thinking about really mixing what is a found object and what is, a, you know, what is a um, crafted object uh, uh, in where the space was, you know, a usable space and where it became an artwork. So I went back to my studio and I actually took all the books off of the shelf. I laid them all on the floor and then I just pulled all of the things that I had in my bag out and I started mixing this. So you'll see there's the toilet paper pieces mixed in here um, with all the things, my keys, my my uh, sneakers, um, there were I had toothpicks, I had saltines, they were all sort of things also that I was using in my studio as a graduate student. I would spend the night there when I was working, so I had all these strange things. But I just brought them all out and laid them, laid them down and tried to mix these two things together. So things like my desk just became you know, impossible to use. So you see in the corner, there's the, there's the desk chair. And this idea also that the artwork had completely taken over and the studio itself had become an artwork. Um, you know, th these, are, these are sort of loosely in chronological order and um, I chose pieces that I thought sort of brought up interesting questions for me. My husband is a scientist and he always looks at artwork by asking a question. Um, he's, you know, because as, an, as a scientist, that's how you start an experiment, you have to have a question. So he's always looking at artwork and saying, well, what is the question? So I think it's also an interesting way to, to talk about work. So, you know, one of the questions I had here was, um, you know, what can you do in a sculpture that you can't do in a painting or in, uh, in you know, with architecture? Um, so, you know, one of the things that I was interested in, if you look at the early work, a lot of it is on the floor. A lot of it is really one, in many ways, one dimensional. It sort of blankets the architecture, if you will. Um, but I wanted to think about gravity as this essential formal qualities that were not, you know, you couldn't do in painting. Um, so this was sort of like the, this was really one of the first sculptures that was actually, to me, you know, fundamentally about gravity. Um, it was in Berlin at the Berlin Biennial, and um, it was in Albert Speer's uh, studio. He, he was the architect for, for uh, Adolf Hitler. So it was a very haunted, um, weighted space, and uh, the whole building had been bombed in, in World War II, and so the, the walls were actually falling apart, and there were little measures that they had put in to sort of measure the movement of the walls falling apart. So I decided to do a piece that actually followed, the, there's a crack, if you can sort of see it here, that actually followed the crack of, 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 the, one, of, of one of the cracks in the wall and sort of escaped out through this, this hatch in the roof. Um, and the, the piece is called Second Means of Egress. And I wanted to have the, really think about making a piece that felt like it was, it was sort of it's trying to escape out, or actually coming down through an escape route. And also to think about building a piece that felt like it uh, was built beyond its own capacity to support itself. That it actually had this kind of ambition that you know, was beyond its own, its own structural support. So the whole piece was made primarily of uh, matchsticks. So this idea of a second means of egress, of like an emergency situation, of sort of 
you know, the, the potential for danger um, in any, uh, you know, building. Um, so there were things like, you know, it, it, it really capitalized on the exit signs, the, you know, there's a, um, there was a fire extinguisher at the end, um, you know, the matchsticks are, are the main structure throughout the whole piece. And the piece actually moved, and later on I'll show you some videos. All of these works have a movement to them. Um, I'm interested in the kind of movement that, that is, you know, like the futurists, where there's no actual movement, but the, but the, the gestures imply movement. Um, but, and also um, a movement that is the result of a natural phenomena. So I'll have fans in the piece that will blow things. So you have this kind of sporadic movement and less in this kind of mechanical movement that, you, you know, putting a motor into a piece. But I'll show you some videos um, a little further on. Um, it's a piece I did in Venice and I became interested in this idea that the piece itself had a kind of behavior. Um, and my idea for this piece was that as the piece got near light, it actually grew. So I started with these lights in, in the work. And generally, my work tries not to use the light of the space. It tries to sort of have this own internal system of light, air, water in, in the work. Um, because I started thinking about this idea of value and I'm thinking about how to make the work actually feel as if it had life breathed into it. This is sort of a very old sculptural idea of how do you breathe life into inanimate you know, objects or materials. So I wanted the, the, the actually the, the sculptures themselves to feel alive. So the idea was that, the, that the, these pieces would go very quickly to a location where they got light, and then when they got light, they would grow. Also had this kind of relationship to ur, you know, the way urban cities develop. You know, they develop around locations. You have a highway develops around a neighborhood. So the piece went, you know, came out of this room that was actually I found on the plan. That did, it was co totally covered, but it was an old um, closet. So I, I opened the closet and the piece sort of sped across the ceiling, and then there was a window that had also been covered by a white wall at the end, and I opened that window. The piece went out that window into the canal, and then it had a, um, a weight that, and an arm that bobbed out on the canal, and when the boats went by, it actually knocked on the window about coming back in. So I chose this piece because this was the first um, piece where I was asked to do a very large space. Um, this is the, the Cartier Foundation in Paris, and it's divine, designed by Jean Nouvel. There's a series, there's a few pieces in here, and in my career I've been asked to do site-specific installations in very, very um, iconic architecture. So when I do that, I'm always thinking about what's the conversation with that building? You know, what, what kind of marriage does it have with that building? This building is a very beautiful building by Jean Nouvel, but it's a very difficult building for artists, because this is the show space. So if you're a painter, it's, it's tough, you know, they end up putting up a lot of walls. But for me, it's a very interesting space. But for me, I'd been doing a lot of pieces that were very small scale, this idea of a kind of um, a work that was built up out of accumulation of very small things. Um, and often in places that were not, not um, immediately uh, presented to you. So in a lot of museum spaces, I would do things in sort of hidden corners or try to excavate spaces that, where you didn't expect to see art. So I was interested in this idea of art being a discovery instead of a framed work saying, I'm important, you know, now I'm in a frame, and I'm in a museum, so you know I'm important, but to put it in places where you actually found them yourself. Uh, so this was interesting because I didn't have really necessarily have the opportunity. I could have done something that was very, very small, but I felt like I needed to, to you know, pull the scale up in the piece. Um, so what I did was I, I sort of did this piece that felt like it had sort of, I think, grown into the architecture. And when you walked in, this is the first thing you saw. And, and like many of these buildings, Jean Nouvel had designed everything. He designed all the lamps, he designed all the handles, the toilet paper roll holder, you know, everything was him. So I, first thing I did was put one of my lamps in and have it kind of invade his when you first walk in. Then when you turn to the left, this is what you saw. And the piece was made up primarily of ladders. And I liked the conversation of the aluminum with the aluminum of the building, so it was actually the same materials of the building. But the ladders made sense to me because they were literally built, um, you know, they're built, designed entirely with scale in mind and the scale of the body to architecture. So every rung, every decision and design is about your body in relation to architecture. So there were, um, I think there were 39 ladders in this piece, um, and I cut them up and, um, and, uh, Re, you know, rejoin them. Um, and it, one of the questions was, how do you, 
you know, how do you make a sculpture on this scale I and mean, still make it feel light, still make it feel fragile, which were which ideas that I was interested in, this feeling that um, it felt live, like a live event, like it just happened. But you know that when you build on this scale that there's, there has to be planning, there has to be engineering. So one of the things that I started to think about was you know, this very old architectural idea, which is the relationship between structure and ornament. Um, it's, it's a you know, fundamental, fundamental discussion. You know, a lot of the modern architects said, you know, they, they, you know, extreme example would be the Pompidou Center, where all of the actual workings of the building become the decoration, as opposed to, you know, many of the, you know, like the train station here. It's all about the ornament. You don't really know how the building is, is set up. So the way that I played with that is I took things like this um, clamp here, and I clamped the sculpture to, to the side. This is actually his stairway. Um, but those clamps actually do nothing. So if you look very closely, you actually, or you know, you can tell that it doesn't, that it's not hanging there, that this is structurally not connected to that. But you know, peripherally, you, under, you, you imagine that this thing is clamped on, and you wonder about the weight. So there's a lot of that going on. Structurally, I also played with this idea of a vortex. So there's actually a lot of empty space up here. I did this piece almost entirely all on site. So I didn't have as much time as probably would have been nice to have. But it's one of the things that to, to fill this space, this kind of vortex quality of rising up um, was one of the ways that I sort of felt like it could occupy this space. Um, I think we had 20 days to make the piece. All the ladders were made there on site. Um, and this, this is, was another thing that helped, was I put a lot of ceiling lamps very close to the floor so it actually levitated the piece. Um, so there was this idea, which I brought up, this idea of the piece itself being an entire ecosystem um, that was sort of, sort of a life support system for, for its own survival. So the whole piece has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, fake flor flora in it, if you will. These, these, so this is plastic, but it has one live plant here, and it has a watering system that started here and dripped down, and these are all, all goes this entire sort of ludicrous system to water this one plant down at the bottom. So also this questioning of what is actually a decorative thing in the piece and what is actually doing something. The whole piece is actually watering this plant. Um, and so there's the, there's the little, this is the real plant. Um, and also, again, this is sort of from the Venice piece, this idea that in certain locations, there was this kind of hyperactive growth. So I, I, this is also what happened. So around these lights, things started to develop and grow in my mind. And there's the light there, right there. And this piece had a ceiling fan in it that was on, and this whole piece was hanging. So the entire piece was sort of rocking because of, because of the ceiling fan. The ceiling fan was slightly weighted on one side, so it had this kind of, it wasn't, again, this idea that it wasn't a me mechanical predictable movement. It had this kind of jerking quality of an, un of an unweighted fan. And then I made the piece sort of squeeze out, this idea that it would like squeeze out of the architecture itself out, in, out into space, so that it almost felt like this was like a tail or a trail, a beginning or an end to the piece. So, um, you know, this piece I put in because I, I was thinking about the idea of how to make a piece that's site-specific with a white wall. Um, and I decided to really think about a natural event happening to that white What happens to a white wall if you neglect it? It starts to peel, it starts to have this, this, this um, uh, potentially, you know, this wa water, you've, many of us have had this water damage situation <laughs> where, you know, the drywalling, you know, to sort of, to make the piece that was actually the paint itself. And I was look, actually looking through the slides for this lecture, I'd never thought of this, but actually it's like a painting. This is a sculpture made out of the paint of the wall. So this is, this is all dried paint. What, so let me go back to this. This is all dried paint here that, and, and um, I actually made a, the wall outside of the, the museum and just installed the wall. Um, so I dried all this paint and cut it and had it sort of peel out. So I'm also interested in this idea of time and how um, you can see the evidence in time through physical gestures. So this idea of a decay or a cruel, an accrual that you can see um, in, uh, in physical things. So that this idea that this was a very slow, natural process that happened over time. But then I wanted to play with this idea that then it was maybe discovered by, um, by someone. So when you came to the museum, things like this and this seemed very 
sort of abrupt and awkward. So you come, you come and this is a very quick act. It's like the mark of someone coming and saying, okay, you know, I'm, this is a construction site. This is a, you know, a work in progress. Like if you go upstairs to the, where the, Alec uh, the Alexis Rockman is, is it the big door? You know, so you get, I wanted you to come into the museum and say, is this a piece? Is this not a piece? And you walk in and this kind of idea that it was almost like an archeological site or a, you know, a site where the, the human hand had come in and said, I'm investigating this, so this lamp. Um, but then that these two these two moments start to meld. So it's almost like there's an, in my mind there was a natural event. It was discovered, but then the natural event almost starts to take over, um, and and the two things sort of come together. And things that are again things that are used to there are all these ideas of measuring na the the natural phenomenon of this event. But then the measuring tools just become aesthetic within the work itself. So this is the, the San Francisco MoMA, and it's, um, it's a very rigorously symmetrical building. And I want to play with this idea of a piece that actually seemed very spontaneous. Again, this idea of something that happened very quickly in time. Um, and you'll see as we get into the details, and I wanted this idea that something had just fallen, tumbled through the space, and then slowly, slowly over time had this kind of different kind of accrual of, of information. So when you first walk in, this is what you see. And one of the things that I'm interested in, I think, in, mo in most of my work is these two kind of perspectives, a very distant perspective where you get an overall view and then a very intimate view. And this is something I, you know, I grew up around Chinese scrolls in our house. And, and you have these large perspectives in, in many Asian um, landscapes. And then you have these tiny, tiny views into you know, into like a human, you know, a, a, it'll be like a farmer milking a cow. So you have this overwhelming nature and then you shoot down and there's not a lot of middle range. I mean, Turner does it too in his paintings. It's like extreme natural environments and the tiny little ship being overtaken. And so I like this idea too that you come in and it's almost like this abstract gesture. Um, and oops, let's see. And when you get closer to it, you, you start to maybe understand more what it is. So this is actually a car that, that I chopped up into five pieces. A, and I guess more like the ladders, it was this idea of taking an object and then trying to, to deconstruct it to the point where it barely maintained its own identity as that object. Um, but I was interested in this piece and how, and this, is, this is, goes back to the idea of what a sculpture can do about sculpture in the round. This space, the, one of the things that's really interesting about this, they call it the oculus, was that you move around in this space into all of these, many of you have probably been there, and you have all of these views, different views on the sculpture. So I wanted to play with this idea of sculpture in the round so that the piece really evolved and had, you had different experience of these two, of these five pieces as you move through them. You know, so these are the same two pieces from many different perspectives. Um, many of you have probably seen the Bernini's in Rome. You see something like Apollo and Daphne, and you move just one foot to the left or right, and it's an entirely different sculpture. I really wanted to play with that idea of your movement, that kind of, um, just that your actual movement in the space changing the sculpture itself. So this was the, those were the first two. This is the third piece, um, and again, this is the, the architecture allows for these interesting views, and then this is what the view of it, that piece from inside, and it had a very intimate you know, feeling, it was almost like looking into the in, inside of like an Easter egg. Um, and they asked this piece to be done for a group show, it was supposed to be up for three months. Um, and this was very in, an in, very intimate experience because you came up the stairs, there were no guards around and it's right on a corner and you walk up and you have this very intimate one-on-one -on -one experience with this section of the piece. But it's totally open to you and to touching. And they actually acquired this piece and they kept it up for three years. And actually not, was not, you know, this is a question that comes up a lot and you'll all have a chance to ask questions, but it was not damaged for three years. Nobody touched the, the work. The only thing that they did, which occasionally people do with my work, is they, they left things in the work. <laughs> which most, usually they're in the vocabulary of the work, so no one who works in the museum even notices, and then I come and I think, I didn't put that there. <laughs> and this is, this is a close-up of the last section of the work, which was just, uh, it was also in the stairway, it was a, was, a, um, was a door, just the door. And this idea that, it was, that the door had fallen there and then this kind of strange, over time, growth happens, happens to, this, to, to this piece. 
um, just talking about this idea of how you move through space and how the work changes, you know, I think a lot about the, uh, the, the work as, as um, almost like a book, you know, the first thing you're going to see when you walk into space, the second thing, the third, and how you can create, you know, a first line in a book and how important that is, and then a crescendo, and then, you know, to, like, so that the piece will wax and wane as you move through it. Um, and uh, this was a piece that I did in Japan, and I wanted it to feel like it's sort of a large, it, as you moved around the stair, it's in a stair, um, it sort of came together into this location. So this is what it looks like at the top of the stair. And almost this idea, you know, from talking from the San Francisco piece, almost this idea that a larger hand than mine had made this piece. So I was really interested in like, what hap how does a piece, how do I make a piece that looks like it's made by centrifugal force? That, you know, that wind has blown, or, or water has blown, there's like a water eddy. Um, and to sort of, instead of making landscape, sort of mimicking landscape and the way that landscape um, behaves. So there's another picture of it. And then when you actually came all the way around, the idea was that then it kind of fell apart in space. So you sort of have this one location where it seems complete, you know, seems to be just right, and then it kind of disappears as you move it to the end. Uh, I put this in just to give you some examples. There are a few examples of work that I've done outside. Um, this is a piece at MIT, and it's, um, it, it, there's a few versions of it. Um, the original title was um, Fire Escape for a Cat. So the idea was that it, that it's, um, you know, it's, it is a fire escape. And I was interested in this idea of, how, you know, how do you deal with the scale of outdoors? How do you deal with the scale of architecture? But I was also interested in this idea of how do you make a work that's site-specific wherever it goes? And that you could have like a site-specific piece that was actually like a kit. So this piece comes, in, you know, that conceptually the idea is you have, like, you know, you have 12 ladders. You have, which are, you know, there's there's three elements here. There's the ladders, there's the balconies, and there's the stair. So you know that you know you could have like an erector set, and you know a set of these, and in any place they be, you know, we could make a sculpture here with them, and it would be totally different than a sculpture here, um, and that it would grow like a virus or like a vine through any space, and any combination could work. Um, this is the site for a piece that I did in, in Manhattan um, for the Public Art Fund, and it was a corner where they actually have an artwork um, regularly. Um, but, you know, one of the problems with Manhattan is it's such a spectacle, There's, the volume is so high on your senses that to get anyone to actually look or stop is a huge, huge uh, challenge. So I was thinking of all these things, how to do it, and I sort of decided in the end that the best thing to do was actually to mirror the, 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 uh, to mirror the space itself, to mirror the buildings, to mir mirror the scale of the city. So I... So this is where they usually have the artwork. So, but I decided to mirror this corner up here. Um, and this is actually the Photoshop for the piece that I, that I presented as a proposal. It's sort of funny because it actually looks very much like the piece. You'll see that the actual images of the piece are really close. And when I was looking through the slides too, I was thinking about how it's interesting that so much architecture we see now actually is affected by these programs like Photoshop because the Photoshop determines what the work will look like. But Side, that's a side point. This is the model for it, the, the low-tech model. So the idea was that the that to, to totally disorient the viewer and to have, you know, Manhattan's all about rising. It's all about how high can you get in space. But to actually totally disorient the, the viewer and pull them down in space and also tilt their, tilt their sense of gravity. So um, that's the model. So the piece actually does this. It goes about uh, 12 feet below ground. That, and this is the finished piece. And see, it was a really interesting piece to me, also that I didn't realize it would do this, but it, to me it was an interesting intersection of sculpture, architecture, and painting, because the window really became a, you know, a framed space, like a painting, or like a Joseph Cornell, like a, it was really, you know, it was like a vista. Um, and uh, then it had a sculptural scale, but also obviously it was imitating architecture. So this, this one piece I thought I'd give you some images of how it was made, because um, it sort of lends to that. So this is my studio in New York, and um, this is a mock-up of, what, the, what, of, of you know, what, you, what we built. The, the actual framework was built and fabricated outside of the studio, but this is actually part of what went down, down below, the structure that went down below. But this was a very important thing to have because uh, this, the perspective into the space was really limited. So it was really important to have that frame um, in, in space. So this is, you see, this is the side of the piece. And this is part of what I built in, inside, inside when you looked in the window. 
one of the practical problems of the piece was actually getting it out of my studio because it was too big for my studio. So the piece actually had to break down into five sections just to leave the studio. So these are what the sections look like. And that's us going down the hallway. And that's it when it arrived on site coming off the, um, the truck. And here's the hole. It, we, we were slightly delayed because they ran into an, uh, a Richard Arschwager from the 1960s that was left down there. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, they said to us that you have, you, have one, you have one day from morning until evening to install this. So that's also why in the studio we had to really build the whole thing. Um, so because just for logistical reasons about being in Manhattan. So these, we had to put the pieces together on site. There's the morning. You'll see by the end it becomes night. So here's the corner, and here's the corner as it came, arrived and came off the truck. There's it going down. There's me looking worried. <laughs> and see, so it's evening by the time we get it in the hall. And there's going to the hall, and that's it at night. And actually another thing that was interesting about, I mean, I always find that the, the best parts of work are things that you didn't know would happen um, or that you discover are gonna happen in the process. And one, I think the night view was really the most interesting um, because the other thing that was interesting about the work was how, how the, the tension between um, you know, the public and the private and how do you create int intimacy in a really public space. So you know, all of these windows are mirrored in here and this idea of looking into an interior and, and seeing that and sort of you know, wa watching um, from the outside was really he heightened. Um, it was also interesting because it's right outside the zoo, and I hadn't thought of this too either, but you know, to see the window, you had to crouch, and there are all these children who came right up to the window, and it was their size. Um, and these are some um, images of the interior. Of one last point from the outside is I was really interested in this tension between not knowing whether, it had, or in your imagination, not knowing whether it was actually coming out of the earth, or whether it was, you know, like, a, like something that's been in the sand and the... And the on the beach and that's sort of washed up and then it reveals itself as the sand goes down um, or something that was sinking. So that, that what it did to actually this surface um, and drew your attention to this, which is a very beautiful thing around the park, this kind of, this um, brick, this brick, this conversation between this brick and this brick. But that, I'm interested in that thing, you know, I was talking about it with the Berlin piece of this tension of what, is it rising, is it falling, trying to find a location where the, the work is uh, teetering between doing several things at once. So the interior was, uh, I, I wanted to play with, with your sense of gravity. So when, in, when you looked inside, you couldn't tell what a floor plane really was. There was only one thing in the piece that was actually um, gravitationally correct. I don't know if there's an image of it. I don't think there is. There's, there was a plumb bob that went right down the middle that if, when you found it, you could tell where, you know, obviously it was doing what it's supposed to do. It was telling you where gravity was. So this is a piece I did after that. It was interesting. Or actually, you know what? I, this is opposite. This I did before. And the, the idea here also was, um, in, a, in a more subtle way, actually, this idea of taking a basic you know, physical quality of your, of your relationship to space and shifting it. And I was interested in the idea that if your gravity is slightly shifted, that your, your whole sense of seeing, your whole way you see becomes sort of heightened because you have to sort of stop and try and reorient yourself in the space. So this idea of reorienting and disorienting the viewer in space sort of as they move through so that you actually look, look more and you sort of discover more was interesting to me. It's sort of like when you're in a foreign country and you don't understand the language and you look at people and you, you actually think, uh, you know, you, you start imagining in a different way or I do, you know, if I'm sitting in France and looking, trying to decipher what people are talking about or here, it's sort of your, you, you sort of have a heightened awareness of yourself, I think. Anyway, so this is, this is in a gallery space and I took out the wall, obviously, between the two, um, between the two rooms. When you entered, there's a, there's a whole bunch of strings that come out of here. I, I had, this is something that people became, this is at the MCA Chicago and they always put on the, on the, um, at the name tag for it. They always talk about this one thing I did talk about, which is true, that I had just seen The Last Supper, um, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper in Rome. And I, it was really, it's, it's such an incredible thing to see in real life. One, because the sighting of it is so bizarre. 
um, you know, there's a, those of you who've seen this, and most of you probably know this, but this, that, you know, the doorway cut into it so that you could get through, and the way it actually holds the entire wall, it's really an installation um, in the space, and the room, how, you know, the perspective in the, when you walk into the room, um, because it really occupies the entire wall is so interesting to me. And I also was interested in how, when you looked under the table, even, you know, it started, the perspective starts with the toes, of, of, you know, and the toes beneath the table and the, and the pieces of um, bread beneath the table and there are all of these little details that shoot you back into space other than actually these lines. Um, but I wanted to play with that in the space. I also wanted to play with this idea that of entering a piece but not knowing you'd enter it. So that was actually a really hard thing to do here was when you first came in, you walked under and by the time you realized you're in the piece, you'd already made the decision unconsciously to be in it. Because one of the things I'm not interested in with installation is this idea that now I'm inside the piece, now I'm outside, you know, where there's almost like a precipice where you go into an artwork. And I'm interested in this idea that you sort of find yourself or discover yourself in the work. Um, I put this in because I thought it was an interesting example of how to deal with scale. The Cartier Foundation, what I did was up the scale on the piece in the work. But in this is a, um, this is a Kunsthalle in, um, Sweden, and it's a massive space. It's it's like a Kmart. I mean, it's huge. And the way to, to deal with it, again, it was how do you deal with this? So my idea was to make, actually make it like a drawing. It's a very beautiful space. Everything is white. The wood is white. But to have the piece almost like a trace or a drawing in the space, and and um, just take the entire floor plan like like a piece of paper and draw a line through it. Um, the only thing that existed beside that wasn't white was this was this mat when you first came in. So almost in a, like a very heavy-handed gesture, I broke this down and made it kind of like a Hansel and Gretel trail into the piece. Um, and then th there was this idea of these almost these kind of like campsites or these locations. And that's how I sort of focused people into the details, um, that you would see these long lines and then these sort of detailed places. So it's almost like taking a trail. So when you turn the corner, this is what you see underneath. Um, my husband's family is Indian, and they're obsessed with rugs. And they would, you know, under the beds, there are piles of rugs. And I was sort of thinking of doing a sort of portrait of him, so I started this idea of doing a rug. But I started making them out of just small pieces of actual yarn, this very laborious um, uh, process. But, and then just covering things around it. So, but I was thinking that this was kind of like a, a tag or a marking in certain locations. And you know, it was when, you, when you're hiking and you go to certain locations and you see the remnants of someone having been there in a trail. Um, so this idea that there's sort of a trail that you follow through here. Um, so you know, these are the lines coming out of that. And it leads to this. There's a hole actually in the floor. I don't think I have a picture in here, but... Um, so it leads you to this. And this is a, a, a tree, if you will, that's made out of all these twigs that I just found around the Kunstala. And then um, I used uh, these dowels to actually support them, but none of them are actually connected. If you look closely, they're all just a bunch of twigs that, that, that are supported by this. And I like this idea that, that the actual scaffolding and the twig are kind of equal in volume. Um, and there's the plumb bob from the ceiling that's trying to reach, reach up to. Um, I was also, you know, there's this, there was still playing with this theme of, of actually your floor plane not being able to hold gravity. So I was also thinking about that floor actually being different kinds of water in different places. So this is a, just a string, but it does this thing to your eye where you really feel like it has that, the ripples of the water. You know, here again, this is like a different kind of water. This is another location where you, this shows up. And there's a, the entrance, there's one entrance from outside where that rug was, and the other entrance is from the library or the bookstore and the library. They have a very beautiful library there. So the, the, for, if you entered from this side, you know, I was thinking about, I'm always thinking about sort of where, where are people going to start? You know, what's the, this is a very architectural idea, how, you know, circulation, how do you enter a building? How does it, how does your experience unfold through the entrance to the exit? So, you know, if you enter through this way, it's this slow sort of, um, spill of the act. These are actually the books from, from the library piled in. And this is like a library, you know, cart. So it slowly, you know, becomes more and more orchestrated as you get further into the piece from that direction. And these are just different locations of um, sort of left, feeling this idea of leftovers of something, that, an event that sort of happened. Now, I was interested in this idea of the leftovers of an event because, again, to me, it had this, the, it, it harkened back to this idea of value. 
um, of how trying to make the work feel like it was a, a live event, you know, sort of the value of something like seeing live jazz as opposed to recorded jazz, or seeing, you know, the thrill of seeing athletics where you see um, in that moment uh, that confluence of luck and skill that come together and the thrill of actually seeing something live rather than seeing it recorded. Um, so to have these pieces feel like, you know, one of the most common questions I get is, well, how long did it take you to make this? And what will happen to it afterwards? And it's a very mundane question, but I think it's actually a very profound question because it, immediately you think about time, you know, and these are just objects, but you think about the, the existence of this and how you sort of have this potential, potentially of this anxiety about how is this going to survive? And I wanted to have that, that be, you know, the volume on that be very high that you had this feeling of um, um, value in the experience, that it was something that was finite um, and had a lifespan and a death. So, um, so this is a piece I did after the piece in, in Sweden. And I started in Sweden, the, the work, you, you actually couldn't, there was no, you actually had to walk over the work to get through it. So those strings, you, you, there was no way to see things unless you actually navigated like, you know, stepped over things, and, and that was actually part of the work. So I like this idea of actually kind of thinking about the work as being like a trap. So for this piece, I sort of started thinking about, you know, that the whole, the whole space was sort of rigged as a trap. So you see these things that actually, these strings are um, the idea of these uh, almost having, um, you know, fuses, and the whole thing, like, if, as you move through it, if you hit any one of these things, it would be this domino effect, and the whole piece would sort of fall apart, or that you were coming in at, it, at a place where it was falling apart. So this is a piece I did in Japan, um, in a Renzo piano building. It's the Hermes building in um, Tokyo, and it's a, it's a really gorgeous, elegant building. The entire building from the outside is, are, are these square blocks, and you have no, none of this, you don't see this from the outside, so you have no sense of scale. It's just like a glass sheet. It's like an iceberg. Because, um, you know, that's how we always, you know, we always measuring the building because you see the floors through the windows. So it's really just one window. And structurally, it's incredible. It's actually, um, it's actually a hanging window. Um, this, this is the structure, and this whole sheet is, ha is hanging off of it. The architect who, they could realize the work of Renzo's design so that you could, they could never do it anywhere but Japan because the, the engineering and the precision of the actual construction was so complex. And in Japan, they actually, they're very good at doing that. But so this is, this is the structure and this is, the, this is the hanging curtain. So I want to play with that idea. So my piece is right here. It's actually, this is one of the columns and all of those objects are actually, they have a hole in them and they fit over the actual column. But when you're in space, unfortunately I don't have an image of the way it hits the ceiling, but it just looks like it's actually jammed up and piled up in the space. Um, and I decided that I wanted to play with this idea from the outside, you have this shooting down the side. So I, so I put these mirrors in so that you actually had the same quality from outside that you had on the inside, which is this kind of intense um, fall, visual fall through space, because there's nothing that breaks it up. And then I took out little panels in the floor so that the, this illusion that it, this goes straight down gets broken, but then it actually has an even sort of scarier fall to it because then you, it doesn't actually have a floor. Um, one of the things that I was interested in was also, uh, let's see if it has in that one, I'll show you, it was also, um, you know, taking some of this very, very elegant space. It's, a, it's in Japan, one of the strange things is a lot of the best show spaces are in commercial spaces. So Shiseido, Hermes, so a lot of the museums, that's where you go. And they're very hidden spaces and they're very elegant. But I wanted this piece to feel almost like, you know, someone reckless had come in and this event had happened. Um, so, and, and that this was sort of the, this is sort of this edge of the earth that the whole piece was falling off of. Um, and you has, it has this view from above actually in the space. And all of these lines were sort of leading up to this column to, to that sort of in real space look like it was supporting the piece. Um, I was also interested in this idea of that, you know, I love ukiyo-e prints, uh, Japanese woodblock prints, and the way, the use of white in, print, in prints in general, because you're always using, you're always, it's always a decision how much to preserve of the white of the paper or not, you know, that's what you're starting with is white. But the use of white in Japanese, uh, traditional Japanese woodblock printing um, is incredible. And so I wanted, uh, partially because the, the way that it, 
you know, absorbs light. And so one of the things that's, you know, one of the most celebrated subject matters is our winter landscapes and the use of snow and how negative space can fall, this thing where it falls totally flat, the white, and then, but also because of what is around it, it actually falls and you have this perspective. So unlike the other perspective lines that I was thinking about, you know, in, classically Leonardo, this is a sort of interesting way to try to talk about the flat picture plane space um, and, and, uh, and how you can shoot it back. So this is, you know, the, I was thinking about a, a sort of a, 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 a winter landscape with, the, with all this paper, but also then these are, if you look at them, these are actually pieces of um, cloth and spray paint to actually, they were mimicking the shadows themselves. Um, and there's, there's really bizarrely very mundane other side to that beautiful front in this gallery space. So I, it actually quite ugly, actually, if you turned your back. It was sort of like you could only take one picture of the space that looked good. But so I sort of made the piece go and, um, you know, this, this sort of snowscape sort of fall into this and open the back, back to sort of reveal the innards of the building. Um, so uh, this is a piece that I did in England. And... I wanted, you know, I was gonna took this after the the Hermes piece. I was thinking about how something trails out, or you know, these fundamental built building blocks, the beginnings and the ends of the pieces. I'm gonna show you a video of this one because it has um, it's start, it's sort of central pieces, this kind of movement. But the in this building, it's it's the it's called the Blue Coat. It's a museum um, designed so that the real element of detail is actually the bricks. It's, I'm sorry, I don't have a better image of this. But what they've done is they've taken all the bricks, and instead of having the, lo the length of the brick, they have the, the, the wall built like this, so the short end of the brick is actually facing forward. So logistically, it makes no sense, because you don't need the brick to be this way. It's just, you know, quadruples the, the numbers of bricks you need. But aesthetically, it was very beautiful. So I decided to play with this idea of bricks. And all of these bricks are just made out of paper. But again, it's the white. You actually read them as weight when you see them. Um, and when you look down into the space, this is what you saw. And uh, this, the piece sort of, you'll see, I'll show you a little video, but the piece is sort of centered around this little carved out area. Um, and you, you see there's a fan here and the string drops down. This is, so you can enter from any of these balconies. This is from below. Um, and this is also from below. There's the, the this is the hanging brick. And then there was this idea that there was kind of a brick factory over here where you, if, you, if you thought these were real bricks, you, if you spent a little time, you could see exactly how they were made over there. And I think I'll go to, I'll try out a video for this one. So like I said, that almost all of the work actually has elements like this in it that move. Um, and I've never given a lecture where I've shown videos, but this actually, I sh this is all of these videos I found on YouTube. <laughs> I wrote them all and I asked them if I had permission and they all gave me permission. Um, but uh, not, and I offered them money, but no one took money, so I sent them catalogs. But um, it's interesting, this is totally edited by, someone, by a viewer. Um, but you can see that this idea that this is sort of the central moving thing that all of this surround, is surrounded by and this kind of, the, this sort of beautiful motion that a string does when you swing it this way. And then it has a brick, at the irony of it having a brick at the bottom, but it actually it's just a paper brick that's making it move like that. Um, uh, let's see, oh, there's, so the, he, this, this fellow shows a lot of smaller details. So it's a very small movement. One of the ideas for the brick was I'd actually had been in a car accident and when the it was this in, intense spiraling of movement, and then the car stopped, you know, as it was like thrown against the, the the side of the highway, and but there was one thing that kept moving, and there was this kind of like daze of this one thing. So I like this idea that there was this kind of calm, moving thing in the in midst of of this kind of very chaotic installation. Um, but you'll see there are all these sort of fluttering things. So this is the brick factory. So obviously in the brick factory, it's really clear, especially also because it's moving, that these things are made out of paper.
So this is um, these. Are, this is the last show I'm going to show you. It's um, but it is it's a series of work. I just did this show at my gallery in New York in September. Um, and um, what's interesting to me is you've seen all these things in succession, but they're all one work. They were always one work exhibited on their own or in a group show where you saw these other different kinds of work. Whereas the last show I did, I was interested in this challenge of how do you do several large installations in one location without what I think is the, an often, you know, a problem to installation where you try and do that, where you have a central piece and then you have sort of the drawings. So you have, you know, you have the main dish and you have the appetizers. Um, or you have several large installations, it just feels exhaustive. So to really sort of think about how to, um, curate or um, choreograph a space so that the, the experience waxes and wanes as you move through it. I talked about that earlier, um, but with your own work in several different pieces. So this is sort of the entrance piece for the show. And I was thinking about this idea of, and actually there's a lot of more work that I make that looks more like this, but often when I'm giving a lecture, I sort of give the most um, photogenic work, which is often the larger installation, because I think they're more interesting to look at in slides. Um, but this piece was important because to me it was negotiated sort of the entrance from the street. In Manhattan you see all over the place you see these stripped bikes more and more. So you see these chains with just the remnants of the bike left over. Um, and I wanted to have this piece that was sort of something that you're used to seeing on the street in Manhattan, but you, but you know, but uh, is is displaced and in the gallery. Um, so this is from outside. Um, I actually stripped the bikes. Uh, this piece I actually made on site. So I, I was actually dry, riding my bike to the gallery to do the installation, and then I thought this is an interesting, my, my, like an interesting thing to actually do is actually to make my bike into a piece. So I stripped the bike there, and I got another bike from, and stripped that bike. And um, you know, whoops. And to me, this idea of like of the piece kind of um, blurring into the gallery space was interesting. So the first thing you see is these decals from the the bike actually sort of put next to the decals of the gallery. So this sort of in, this sort of playful um, intersection of my hand and the gallery's name, I thought it was sort of funny, because also this idea of a commercial space and their name, um, but the window being this uh, interesting space to have a piece. Um, and then they also have this, the next thing that you see is um, they have this, uh, it's unusual for most guys, but they have a, a space where they have a kind of library, and you don't usually see work there, but I decided to do a piece that sort of felt like it was like an imposter in the space. Now, these are all recyclables from the making of the work in my studio. So as I made the work, I had about three assistants with me. Um, every day after we ate our meal, we'd pour plaster into the, 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 the food containers that we had. The next day we'd open them. So it kind of it has actually kind of a fluxus represented, sort of reference to this idea of you know, marking time or marking consumption, your own food. So these, and also this idea of a vessel that, you know, becoming a solid, a liquid becoming a solid, you know, they're, all of them are originals because the mold you know, is, is gone. Um, but then I wanted it to sort of invade the space. And the rule was that it had to actually be doing something if it was on the shelf. So it, all of these things are actually end up being just like book holders. Uh, and if you turn, they were on the floor and they were hidden here and there. So they were kind of like invaders. And, I, and they had asked me about a title for this piece and I, for this show, which I had never done. But then I thought, oh, this is an interesting exercise. What would I title it? And I think that would have been, uh, for me, the show probably would have been titled Imposters and Impossibilities. So the larger projects are all kind of impossibilities. And the, all the smaller projects or the pieces in here are like imposters in the space. So this, when you turn from the library, you saw this. And I, I put this um, curtain rod in here. And then these pieces, these um, thin um, strips of, or chains of ball bearing came down. So it was almost like, you know, the, this is what I think is a reference, for me was a reference in some ways to Felix Gonzalez Torres. And the bikes and these, this idea of pairs of kind of, you know, he did these, these very beautiful pieces that were kind of like couples always. He did this beautiful um, piece where there were just two clocks that are totally in sync. And, you know, so this idea, that idea was, was something I was thinking about, and he did these curtains, so it's uh, it's pretty direct reference to him. But they come down, so they sort of start, and this line comes off the curtain and leads through you through the crack of the architecture, and that and so you sort of focus on this because it has this very detailed quality to it. This sort of you know this pretty generic um, stool with this stool that's made out of mostly out of toothpicks, 
um, and the lamp also made out of toothpicks. But then when you turn, you look into the gallery and this is what you see. And um, you know, one of the ideas here was, this is a very kind of awkward space, but I wanted to play with this idea of, of a sculpture being framed. And um, you, many of you may have, been, have seen um, the Taj Mahal, but in, it's so incredible to see in um, real life because it's actually, you look at pictures and you think it can't be more magnificent, but it's so breathtaking. Someone said to me, it'll bring you to your knees. And you actually, I think, have that quality. And the reason, I think, for me, was very surprising is because of the way you enter it. It's actually, you enter it from very far away and you go through a series of arches that are quite deep. So you're, and you see it very far away. It's a tiny, tiny building floating. And as you, you, and your movement through it is through these dark spaces and then you open up into court and then you go into a dark space. And it's this aperture that gets closer and closer. And when you come out to the garden, it's just this incredible relief of, of light. And then there's a river behind it, so you ne it's totally framed. And you never see it, so it's just the building against the sky, and it has that incredible light hitting it. And the reflection of the water is also why it has that light. Anyway, not to, not to compare this to that, but, <laughs> um, but I did want to have this idea of like a pictorial framing where you came in and you sort of were presented with this. And then I had this idea also that you, that you know, that you were stopped in your tracks. So the whole, this, the, you know, the whole piece is actually a right angle, uh, on a right angle, but the right angle is shifted. So you're, so you don't really know how to enter it. Um, I was also interested in this idea that, um, you know, at any one point you have to make a decision about where to go. There's a larger idea, I think, about the work, about when you have so much visual information, you have, at any one point, seven different directions you can go. Um, cur curators have talked about this, and I think it's an, um, it is an interesting idea that this is something that we actually, a way that we think, or, you know, we're all trained to think, and children are trained to think even more, just because so much of our information, so much of our time is spent on the web. This idea that at any window you have six directions, and that leads you in six directions, but any choice will lead you in this kind of fractal way to a different visual experience. So that, so the first entrance I wanted you to be in the situation where you don't, you, you don't know, you move left or right. It's all, uh, immediately a decision. I was also interested in this idea of that, that I sort of learned from Japanese gardens where there's, they're totally non-hierarchical, but where they actually have a step in the garden where you have to look down. And when you look up, it's completely choreographed and the, everything is composed, but you feel like you're discovering something in nature. So you wander and then there's a step and you look up and it, everything is composed in space and you wander totally different than something like Versailles or a Palladian villa where there's this one place you're supposed to go. And your end experience is actually much more like a filmic experience of these sort of one juxtaposed with the next. So that was another sort of compositional idea for this. Um, so the interesting thing to me about this piece is when you turn, when you actually, if you took a left, as you moved around, the piece kind of actually splits into two sections, oddly. Um, and it, it, you actually have a very direct walkway. So at the first, you're very, you slow down a lot because you don't know where to go. But as you move one direction, you realize it's actually, there's this pathway that you can go through. And as you move into that pathway, you actually end up, you move sort of quickly into that pathway, you end up, you're inside the piece. And then your scale completely shifts down. And you're in the scale of the shelves. Um, and the shelves were kind of this idea, this almost this kind of cascading movement. You know, it almost has this falling water, Frank Lloyd Wright quality to, to, that plays with gravity, plays with this lightness that, it, you know, um, the cantilever is a very beautifully, you know, inherently, you know, makes light, but, um, you know, plays with gravity um, inherently in its structure. So the whole piece is really these cantilevers that fracture down. Um, but they're really just a series of shelves. And then when you get in closer, they, they all sort of, um, you, you're in the scale of a shelf. So you're, it's a much more interior experience. And this is coming all the way around. Then you can understand it actually is just sort of like a very, very straight on aisles. Um, I think, should I do these videos? Um, okay, because I was running a little bit late, but okay, I'll do this quickly. So I'll just do a quick video of, um, so you can see this in space. Um, this one doesn't have any sound, but so you can see there's some details that have movement in them. I mean, it's, it, also this idea that, you know, for me it was interesting when you first walk in, it's this cascade. When you, then when you come around the corner, 
it's, it's actually a pathway. And then when you go through it, it's, there's actually an arch. So all these sort of like very fundamental architectural things. And then when you go all the way through, it's like a wall that's falling. So these things, in the same way that that Cartier piece, these are not holding up the, structurally this line. They don't hold up the piece at all. The whole piece is at a tilt, but all of these sort of lines, they look like they're holding the work up, but they're not, that same idea. But then when you come all the way around, you sort of, you know, you can you see all of these different perspectives on, on, on the work. Okay, that's good. Let's go on to one. I'm going to sort of, I think, quickly go through this to the last piece. So the other idea was that these, the, this kind of language would show up in different pieces. Um, so this was a detail that you actually don't notice, really, when you first come in, I don't think. It's right here. And most people go like this, actually. But um, there's a room back here. And one of the things I think that made the show work is that this, this sort of is how empty or full spaces were. And things like this, like this shadow, implied that there would be this huge piece back there. Um, but when you went back there, it was just this one section <laughs> to the back. Um, and I don't, ha I, I don't have a video of this, but there's a reflection of water. And this whole, every wall had a kind of a reflection of water. It was a very dark space. So it had this very cave-like quality to it. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, this whole show actually had a lot to do with landscape. So each of these had this kind of landscape quality to them. This is a piece that's upstairs, um, unusual in that it has a, um, a skylight. This frame on the floor is the same dimensions of that skylight. So it was, to me, it was almost like they had come down and fallen there. For me, the downstairs, the kind of impossible project was this idea of like a visual um, encyclopedia and the impossibility of an encyclopedia. It's outdated the minute you make it. Um, and what to put in, what not to put in. This piece was sort of about the impossibility of how to frame a horizon to me. Um, so that's a detail. And this is the last piece I'll show you. Um, uh, and I think it's the one that I'm most interested in for future work right now and the pieces I'm working on. But it's, the idea was very strange to me because I actually had a very specific project in mind that I wanted to make a, pl a planetarium that was like a planetarium for one person. Um, but have it be this kind of you know, cobbled together, um, desperate attempt to do that. Um, and, uh, but to me, that was sort of such a literal idea. It came from this idea, Arthur Danto, um, the art historian said to me, you know, your work functions much less like architectural models because they're not things that are built to be upscaled. They're not things that stand in for something to be built, but they function much more like scientific models because they demonstrate behavior that they're actually, and they're actually behaving themselves. So like a DNA model, for example, they're actually telling you about behavior. They're not about something to be built. So I liked that idea, so I wanted to try and do something that was actually, really was like a scientific model. Um, and so this is, this is the planetarium. Um, and the, the last thing I'll do, I'll show you a, a very short video of it, and then we can go to questions. So there's a, um, you know, in this sort of low-tech, no-tech way, there's an overhead projector with a black um, piece of paper with holes in the, the toilet paper, harkening back to the, the first slide, that blows in the wind that creates this kind of flat, the twinkling of the stars. So that's, that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Yes, question. Um, so I, I like how often you've been able to get away with uh, creating the apparently impossible. <laughs> Um, and I wonder, have, have you ever just fallen on your face trying to do that? Has, has your uh, sculptures ever just crashed to the ground or someone says, no, you can't excavate New York or <laughs> um, big uh, obstacles? Uh, I think, you know, with all of these, uh, there's a trial and error and um, I'm very good with deadlines. So I just figure out how much trial I, and error I can do till the point of, you know, knowing that there's an opening involved. Um, I think that this idea of a marathon and, and even like the value of labor, isn't it? So, you know, all of these, there's a point, you know, a week before that 
there's this anxiety of will it work? And I think that kind of anxiety is part of, you feel like this could go, is teetering on you know, the brink of disaster. So I think that is part of, of, of the, the project and this idea of the marathon. Um, uh, there's, they have never fallen down. I think that that's really important, that they look much more fragile than they are. They're actually quite sturdy, to the point where if you have a four-year-old pulling on something, like my four-year-old does, that's not going to happen. So they're, they're actually built quite, there's, it's, that, it's that challenge. But I think there's, you know, I, I teach also, and I think there's, you know, I play with this idea that there's hiders and there's showers in sculpture. And people, you know, like when you go to a James Terrell, you don't really know how it's done. And this is, it's not a value, it's not necessarily a value judgment, but you know, I think it's a decision you make as a sculptor, whereas in my work, if you want to know how it's made and you spend the time, you can see it. There's nothing hidden. So the actual um, pyrotechnics are like, you know, half of it is you, you know, I'm giving you the gun, but you're using it. So uh, I think that tension is interesting to me. Yes. I, I was curious, where else have you lived besides New York and have you done this work strictly since you've been in New York? Uh, and does uh, any of your other work uh, reflect other environments? I think, you know, I think I'm really attracted to urban environments and I think that's definitely part of the work. Um, uh, you know, I'm someone who feels safer in, in, a, in a city than, in, in, than out in the woods. Um, I grew up in Boston, um, then I lived in New Haven, uh, lived in Tokyo, and then lived in New York. I think those are the places that I've lived. Um, but I'm definitely, you know, I, lo I love living in New York. I like that, that tension of everything being on. I mean, I think New York is like that. You think it's a miracle that something's not falling on your head at all points. And, and that is interesting to me. I liked Berlin. I lived in Berlin a little bit when I did that. And I, Berlin had this kind of, um, intense quality of the of of the, the you know the city the life of the city being you know just again this idea that it was in the piece of growing almost faster than it could keep up that answers your question yes hi um you talked a lot about like how you wanted your pieces to look there was a vent that just happened and yep. um you like often trick people into interacting with your pieces so I'm wondering if you consider yourself as someone who causes chaos wherever you go, or like an unauth unorthodox organizer who presents both like the commonly seen and commonly unseen in an unusual way. Hmm. I mean, those are I think those are both really nice descriptions. Um, you know, I think this idea of um, locating something that is just sits between two things. Um, you know, even in terms of the reading of the materials, if something, if there's too much too volume on architecture, if there's too much volume on nature, if there's too much volume on, you know, tools of measurement or, you know, things like that, I try and balance it with something else so that every time you think it's one thing, it moves to the other. So I think both of those ideas are really essential. Um, but that uh, at any one time, I want it to be both. I want you know, to, to think that, wow, this is obsessively organized, but then it's completely chaotic, and then it goes back and forth, um, and that your decisions about how you move through or see the piece actually are, again, are part of, a part of where are, are part, you're deciding, const you're actively deciding um, for yourself whether those things are happening for you in the work. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I was going to ask about the notion of collaboration versus mm -hmm. intervention and some idea about whether you have collaborated with architects or with other people in your projects mm -hmm. and also, you know, have any architects sort of responded to your work that's been placed in their work or anything mm -hmm. like that? It's inter that's an really interesting question. And it, um, so Jean Nouvel really loved that piece. Uh, he was really, he, he said it was his fa the favorite, most, most favorite thing he'd done there. You never know. I mean, obviously the aesthetic is so different than his. Um, but I think he really liked that it, it was so obviously connected to the, to the work in a different way. I think, you know, it's an interesting question because um, you, I've been also asked, I don't know if I showed anything, to do installations in work that hasn't been made yet. Um, and that's a very different experience, you know, because then it is like a, you know, a collaboration. I think actually I'm quite good at being given a, a situation and having to deal with it. You know, like I'm a better cook if there's five things in the refrigerator and you have to create it. 
So I, the limitations I like. I like the limitations. I like to have a set frame and make a decision about what that conversation is going to be. Um, I think that actually that's that in some ways I like that better. I have two less sort of es less esoteric questions. Number one, how how much detail do you plan these mm -hmm. pieces ahead of time? Do you work within the space when you get there, or do you have them really planned ahead? Of yeah. So I mean, it really depends on the on the location and the piece. So you know, if you if I have five days, you get a five day piece. If I have three months, you get a three day piece on the site. But then there's also you know, like for San Francisco MoMA, we couldn't build. You know, we could only build. I mean, basically more than twenty days is impossible to do in the way I work because often. We'll work from eight in the morning till ten at night for twenty days. So you can't, do, you cannot really function past twenty days at that level. So you're always working back, which that. So that's the longest install. So for SF Momo, that we measure, I made locate. You know, I decided what the larger gesture through that space would be, and then we found the locations. I measured them out and built them in this in the space. So I just built like you know the wall, and then then the car was broken up in my in my studio. But then a lot of the detailing went in, and actually surprisingly, that piece, one of the most important things is how they connect, even though they're just lines, and that all happened on site. And I think for even, for some pieces, they're bought and reinstalled in other locations. I always try and do something that really makes you feel like it happened on that site. And that can mean, you know, if it goes to Germany, there are German things in it. And in that German space, there are, there's a doorknob that it's tied off on, you know, so in a very simple detail like that can make you believe the whole piece is just made for that space. So it's one thing that's kind of, you know, that's kind of interesting that way. All right, and my ne next question is, where can we see your work somewhere close by in the near future, or do you have anything now? Um, I have, I just did a piece in Tokyo. I, was, I didn't bring that's slides of that. <laughs> it's a different piece than the one there. I just did it, um, I just came back from Tokyo. I did a piece there, that's, you could go. Um, um, closer than that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm doing a piece on the high. I'm doing several pieces. I'm doing a piece in London. Um, uh, I'm doing a piece uh, in. Uh, sorry, they're all far away. There's a piece in New York, and I'm going to do a piece for the High Line. The High Line oh, is being okay. extended uh, the next ten blocks. So I'm doing a piece on that. Do you know when you're going to be doing that? Um, yeah, it actually opens in uh, in May. I'm doing a, the um, I'm doing the 92nd Street subway station. That's not for a while. So it's either I'm sort of giving you far away or far away, far away physically or far away in time. I'm doing a show at the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia. That's closer. Thank you. Over here. Oh yeah. Sorry. I wanted to ask you what kind of play materials uh, you used as a child, about age two to five. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, my father was an archi is an architect, and my mother um, wa it was she's not she's retired, but was a, a kindergarten teacher. Um, and our house was definitely filled with, you know, tons of my father's office was wherever he went, and it still is. Um, and you know, our house was filled with seven animals on any vacation that my mother would take back from the school, you know, and take care of. So. Um, we, I played a lot with those things, um, and I think that does come into the work, um, you know, but you, probably the same things that everyone else plays with outside of that, whether it's Legos or Ecto sets, um, was never that into dolls, stuffed animals, um, sports, uh, I think there's a sports component to the, to the, um, that, you know, to the, this idea of the marathon and the work as well, but um, and I think the idea of like an interior space that I think children create for themselves, although I think the the relationship of the work to children is always di is also is, is always an art. It's always a very like you know it's always a very fragile territory um, because I think obviously so much of it is the decision making process and the editing process is something that that doesn't that def differentiates it so much from that. Should we take one? Do, I don't know about time. Should we just take one more? Does anyone? Okay, just so this. Sorry, there's two people. So we'll just take one last one. I'm sorry. Or should we take the last two? I don't know what to do. You tell me. Okay, last two. Okay. So you spoke a lot about the the large, almost architectural um, aspects of your work, but not so much about the more intimate spaces and the materials and the yep. choices you make. Can yep. you tell us something about that? Sure. I mean, I think it's really important, uh, and this has to do with value. I mean, I think ultimately. 
you, the experience in our lives that are meaningful are these very, very intimate experiences. So this idea of like a survival space or a space of the essentials or sort of, you know, this idea of, you know, what you bring when there's a fire, like what do you keep, what is, what is meaning, and how do, you, how do we invest, you know, meaning, like, you know, what are the five things you would keep if you had a fire, you know? It was something that, I don't know if it's still asked in graduate school a lot, but I remember there was like, a, it was almost became a cliche, but I think it's a very important question where people would ask, you know, if this studio, because graduate students would be all heady, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and you say, well, if this studio burned down, which of these paintings or which of these would you take? And it would a lot of the times not be the one that they were talking about. But to sort of you know try and touch a kind of I intimacy in a location or or a, a, a work is I think really really primary to, to what I'm trying to do. What what can you tell us about the MacArthur experience and how did it change you? Um, you know it's it's an incredible honor. I mean it's overwhelming. I think one of the things that it does is it it gives you validation outside of the art world. You know, the art world is a very insular space and place. And, um, you know, I think for me, that's, it's, it's, it's how I, you know, you function when you, and all of you in your different prof professions, if they're outside of art, become, there's a material language to it um, that gets, that, you know, that gets very insular and self-referential. Um, but I think with art, it can, it, it's definitely, you know, it's always a tension. Um, so to have a, an audience outside of it um, and a kind of uh, is, I think, an incredible outside of obviously the money, but this kind of it gives you a voice on a different level that I think is, is an, 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 it's a, you know, a completely invaluable. Um, and it gives you a, a conversation with other people, you know, the other fellows. Um, they don't require you to do anything for the MacArthur, which is amazing, this kind of trust in um, the freedom of the, that that position can give you with absolutely no strings attached. But they do offer you, to get, if you want to go, to go on retreats. And so um, you can go on these retreats where pe people talk about their work and you meet them. And it's just fascinating to see other people in, across the board and in, in, in their own professions doing amazing things. So that was, that was really, I think, the greatest honor from it. And it allowed me to make a lot of choices, like not make sellable work at certain points, <laughs> because I, I could pay my rent otherwise. So it really gives you that freedom. Thank you.